Here is AutoBest uh, Summit series. This time we go live with uh, Mazda Europe. As you know, we, we started uh, this European debate, this European discussion, uh, by, based on the idea that uh, the public health crisis will gradually go, what the car industry is doing after this. So far, things are not going so well with the public health crisis in Europe, but that's it. We, we all understand and we cannot simply do uh, nothing. We all have to do something and we all have to find a way to go through our uh, lives and our social uh, countries and economies. We are very happy to have uh, as uh, two key uh, speakers uh, of uh, uh, Mazda Europe. First of all, it's Martin Ten Brink, the Vice President of Sales and Customer Service. Hello, Martin. Hello, nice to be here with you today. And of course, our dear friend Wojciech Halarevich, the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs. Hello, Wojciech. Hello, good morning, everybody. It's really a pleasure and honor to be here with you. It's, it's good to say, dear friends from all around Europe, that we have uh, uh, dear jury members from many, many countries of Europe. Uh, you will uh, interact with them uh, uh, from time to time because we will have a Q&A uh, session. Uh, this is uh, live on Facebook uh, of AutoBest, obviously. Uh, we promoted this and we are expecting an important number of uh, Europeans customers who are really interested about Mazda uh, Europe, what is doing, uh, what can be done in the future, and how complicated is uh, for Mazda uh, the, the situation uh, they have, we have in Europe. I'm uh, very happy to tell you that I have a co-moderator, which is uh, our dear distinguished colleague from Austria, Gerhard Kunczyk, which is also the Vice President of the AutoBest uh, Jury. Hello, good morning everyone and thanks a lot for joining us this morning for this very interesting meeting, at least I hope so. Perfect, let's start and um, we, we all believe that um, the best warming session, uh, Martin uh, and Wojciech, will be you to have a wrap up, a brief introduction of the Mazda in the first six months, of course, in Europe. Well, I think um, if I start from a sales perspective, I can hand over to Wojciech for, uh, for the other side of the business. Um, for me, the, um, um, I've been with Mazda in Europe for about 20 years, and I've gone through uh, ups and downs uh, in, in many crises, but also in many uh, moments of, uh, of extreme joy and, uh, and good performance. And uh, um, I had not, I did not see anything bad coming at the end of the year, beginning of uh, uh, this calendar year. Uh, we were doing very well. We had some plans for 2020, which was going to be a challenging year uh, from many perspectives. Um, but we, um, we actually i was most concerned in the beginning of the year whether we were going to have a good supply chain because of course things were happening in uh, in china and we have um uh, we have on most of our vehicle lines we have components that uh, that are produced in china and my concern initially was very much will we keep the supply chain running so there was a lot of pressure in uh, in uh, in january february and early march just to make sure that we would have enough vehicles coming down the pipeline uh, on the ships uh, with a relatively long supply chain from, uh, from Japan compared to some of the, uh, the other manufacturers, of course, who produce locally. Uh, we needed to make sure that we were not gonna have hiccups in our supply chain. So my, most of my attention and my worries initially were focused around making sure that the, the supply chain was running. And then when uh, Europe started getting affected, we, uh, we, quickly, um, we quickly made uh, changes to our, to our volume planning, uh, changes to our business planning initially, and those were all around securitization of the business, making sure we're not gonna get into um, a trouble that we could have avoided or that we could have um, uh, prevented. Um, 
a lot of my time has been focused on uh, on uh, communication with the markets with all our 27 national sales companies uh, in order to understand what was happening in the markets in terms of where are dealers open, where do we actually have operations going and where are operations stopped and um, what is then the running rate of the business, um, making sure our people were safe, that our people could work from home remotely as we're now also connected in, uh, in, in Zoom, uh, it was very important that we had the tools uh, within the company environment that people could work remotely, that people that needed to continue to work in, um, uh, for example, in distribution, in warehouse uh, operations for parts and accessories, but also in vehicle operations could continue to work safely. And I think that was where most of the time uh, went to, and it was only, I think it was only in, uh, uh, it, it took it took me, and the team some four to six weeks to really comprehend what the dynamics were that were happening in the marketplace, how consumers were reacting. Our business came to a, a virtual standstill, uh, like everybody else's business um, across Europe. We didn't really have customer order intake anymore in the, in the month of April and May. Um, we were delivering cars that had been ordered or replacing cars when there was uh, when there were contracts that were were starting, but we really did not have any operational uh, business contributing at least to to future planning, um, and uh, that has since I think since the uh, beginning the late May early June that has picked up quite rapidly for us. Um, my focus now is on making sure that we have the right stock levels that we can supply in the right countries in Europe because there's an imbalance between supply and demand between different countries and uh, to make sure that we, uh, that we perform this, uh, this calendar year, this fiscal year in the best way possible, being able also to supply um, uh, um, the dealers with not only the, the, the vehicles but also with uh, the tools for selling introduction of new vehicle, the electric vehicle that is coming. Um, in, uh, in a month and a half. Uh, so we're very busy, extremely busy. Um, I'm glad that the, the worst, at least from a, uh, uh, from a sales perspective, is, uh, is, is over. And I look forward to uh, making sure that the curve that is on the graphs going like this keeps on going in the right direction. Wojciech for... Martin, sorry. Martin, just a sec. Before we go to Wojciech, mm -hmm. Just to put the, the, the all European uh, friends in the real perspective, according to the ASEA, in the first six months, uh, the sales operation in European Union uh, plus UK plus uh, the other regions, it's minus 52.6. How bad is for Mazda this? Um, well, of course it's bad. Nobody likes to, uh, we don't have the margins that suddenly allow you to uh, sell 50% less or 60% less where, where we are. We had always planned uh, in a year over year basis, 2020 for us was going to be a slower year. Um, um, last year was a record number year. This year we were uh, going to manage it uh, carefully. There were many things that we had already factored in around what is happening with exchange rate, what will happen with the UK. So we hadn't been very uh, ambitious in that sense. Um, it is very bad, I think, especially for our dealers at the, at, at, at the front end of, of, of retail operations. But I also think that we have been, you know, we're cons generally conservative in the way we approach the business. We've been relatively well planned in, how, what, in our investments. So from a corporate perspective, I think uh, you, we can withstand a shock like this. My concern is that the retail business picks up quickly uh, in order to ensure liquidity for, for dealer partners. I understood. Wojciech? Thank you very much. Um, yeah, so let me give you a little bit uh, more, uh, to show you a little bit more beautiful part of this business, because uh, I think that, and the family believe that every crisis also uh, somehow makes the beauty appear, okay? So um, a few words, I joined Mazda in 2007 and I started up uh, operation of Mazda in Poland. Then I moved in 2001, uh, in, um, uh, yeah, in 2011, in 2009 uh, to Italy, uh, where uh, we were deeply reforming the Italian operations uh, uh, um, of the Mazda in, in Rome. And from 2013, uh, I came to Mazda Europe here to Leverkusen, where uh, where I have the pleasure to be uh, to be today. 
um, and I'm responsible for communications, public relations, public affairs, uh, marketing and customer experience. Uh, so what happened? What's going on with us? So first of all, uh, um, yeah, this is the COVID year, but let's not forget that this is also the year of the 100th anniversary of Mazda. So probably we could imagine it could be, it could be the better moment to, uh, to celebrate, but but I don't see this negatively because in this 100th anniversary of Mazda, we are launching the first ever electric vehicle, that is MX-30, and probably we'll spend some time to talk about the electrification strategy of Mazda, but we are quite proud that we are able to put the real vehicle, not the toy, uh, or let me say kind of uh, not real, real car, we are putting real electric car uh, uh, to the market. This is also the, 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 the year where also your uh, group awarded us uh, uh, with Skyactiv-X engine as, uh, let me say, the best technology. And uh, we really appreciate it because uh, believe me or believe us that at the moment of challenges of all those case trends, it's not easy for the companies to take decision to do something that nobody has done so far. And uh, such kind of recognition that came from Autobest is something that really uh, made, made us happy. Also, uh, in between, we won uh, World Design Car of the Year for our for our Mazda 3. Uh, uh, so this this makes us makes us happy. But you know what COVID made uh, made uh, uh, let me say and somehow how COVID influenced our strategy. So first of all, we firmly believe that some people understood that car uh, can become the really the safest means of transportation. Uh, we saw how public transport transport suffered, how certain so-called innovative schemes like uh, like car sharing were suffer, suffering during the COVID period, and suddenly appeared that maybe owning the car became kind of the advantage. And uh, we believe we believe it is. Uh, is it going to change the trend? Let me see. The sharing economy is going to disappear now, but I think that a bit of reflection of the use cases will happen. And the second thing that really made my life uh, very exciting is that digitalization, so the customer dialogue, the trends of how we approach customers, how we talk with customers are just accelerating. And uh, we as automotive, I think that we as industry were reasonably conservative. Yes, we talk about connectivity, but we were always behind some industries like telecoms or some FMCG. Uh, industries and we believe that this digitalization that will put customer at the center of everything we do in very efficient way has been really accelerating during the COVID period uh, and last but not least uh, probably you will have some questions or we can discuss what is also happening in terms of regulatory okay so all the green deals or the CO2 regulations that are happening in Brussels so one big part where Mazda uh, and I personally, uh, with great let me say, support uh, of, of the team, uh, we are very present in different discussions in Brussels to talk <laughs> about Green Deal, about, let me say, what is going to happen with CO2, uh, how European Commission, how European teams are seeing electrification itself. So quite exciting period, but uh, only few things that are, belong to old economy, a lot of things that belong to the new economy. So uh, we are quite excited. Great. Um, for our friends in Europe, uh, just a, a small uh, description. Uh, the award which uh, Wojciech was referring is uh, TechnoBest. <coughs> every year, almost every year, awarded by uh, AutoBest jury at an European level. And is about the best automotive classical technology we have in the industry. Because we, we have different awards for the other uh, uh, kind of digital uh, on uh, onboard technologies, uh, of course, infotainment. So there are other things. But nowadays, to have a company pioneering something in the classic automotive technologies, it is really, really very rare. That was the reason that the jury said, hey, Mazda did something, as Wojciech said, uh, quite unique. Gerhard? Yes, uh, once again, good morning, everyone. And uh, my first issue that I want to address is, and this is probably going to Martin. Uh, by the way, Martin or Martin? 
That is Martijn in Dutch, but I listen Martijn. to everything that starts Martijn. with an M and ends with an M. <laughs> Thank you for this clarification. Um, uh, with uh, almost a standstill in the in the production plants and uh, with uh, short time work in in, in Europe everywhere. Um, how was the the supply uh, chain working? Was it was it interrupted once? Uh, could you get all the orders? To the customers or was there an interruption and uh, did it uh, concern special models or was it a general problem across the, the fleet? Oh, um, yeah, it's, it, it's interesting. It was for me, of course, a, a, an interesting experience in my role that I have now. If I look at Mazda's history, we've, we've, we, we've been able or we've had to deal with crises like this with our supply chain from Japan also in the past. I don't know if you remember the Fukushima Daiichi incident where suddenly our supply chain interrupted due to non-availability of parts or transportation. Um, and I think we have learned from that in a number of ways in the past. Um, first of all, our footprint uh, that we have now is not only vehicles from Japan, but we also source for Europe from Thailand and from, from Mexico. Um, but what happened, as I said initially, it was more the concern about parts availability from China. And um, in a second wave, then we had what is actually the, the, the physical limitations of being able to have people in the in the in the ports and in the factories working, uh, and then of course your physical distribution from from ports to to dealers where people need to receive vehicles. So what happened was that because our vehicles, uh, most of our vehicles, of course, come then from from Japan, there is by definition a month that the vehicles are on the boat. So once a vehicle is in the boat, I can tell you it will arrive, and I can precisely schedule when it will arrive. What we saw, however, was that, for example, many European manufacturers that were exporting to the United States or to other parts of the world kept producing, uh, whilst, for example, Asia went into a shutdown. So cars were piling up in the ports, you know, whether that's Bremerhaven or, or Antwerp or Rotterdam. Cars, were cars kept on coming out of the factories from European manufacturers that went to the ports but they were not departing anymore to go to uh, uh, to their overseas destinations. For us, the vehicles were coming in, but of course you need space in the port to physically move the vehicles around and to transport and load them onto the trucks. So you had sort of this cascade effect from around the globe where different regions were affected at a different time, which created quite a strange situation when you come to physical distribution. Um, we quite luckily, based on the experience that we had, I think, in, 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 um, in 2011, we, we dramatically reduced allocation for Europe. Even though I was quite positive, I have to say that also my the counterparts in Japan who'd been in production planning for a longer time had said, no, be more careful here because you're going to get physical restraints. So we actually pulled the handbrake, although the, fa the factory could continue to produce. There was not a problem in Japan to produce, and Japan has been mildly affected by COVID, and there have only been temporary shutdowns uh, in the production pipeline. Um, but we've basically made sure that we kept our supply and demand with a normal, with a normal stock level in place and did not anticipate initially on a quick recovery. And that kept our total stock levels in, uh, in balance quite well. We did not have to do uh, any crazy things and we could use our normal storage facilities. Although you run into situations where really physical availability of people, things take more time. Uh, unloading a vessel takes more time. Um, um, we've had to work very well with uh, the people in port operations, um, with the, the uh, people in transportation. Um, we've kept vehicles firm in, in, in port, uh, depending on the, the countries where they went to. Uh, Italy went into a complete shutdown, uh, Spain in a shutdown, UK in a shutdown, but Germany did not really go into a physical distribution shutdown. Netherlands didn't, the Nordics didn't. So we managed it uh, uh, quite well. And also we have common specifications essentially across Europe. So what we did is we transferred vehicles that maybe originally were destined for for the Spanish market, we, we, we transferred those to, to the north and um, um, we were able to balance quite well in that sense. But it was a bit of a surreal experience because normally, um, you know, vehicle transportation and logistics 
is like uh, water coming out of the tap and suddenly you have all sorts of challenges there that you need to actively manage as a management team with your dealers, with your banks that are providing funding, uh, with the manufacturing, with the supply chain. And I, I'm quite proud of how we did it and the flexibility of our manufacturing helped quite a lot because we produce in the factory in Japan, for example, five or six car lines on the same line. So we were relatively easily, we could shift between one car line and another. Um, and we could moderate our logistics through swapping between markets quite well. So we had a big, big reduction in overall production, but we didn't get into any um, any uh, bottlenecks that we couldn't solve. Just to follow up this, uh, did you have to, to reduce your workforce in Master Europe, or do you know of any uh, redundancies in, in any import companies? Um, well, with regard to our operations in uh, in the markets, we have, so in all our 27 markets where we operate and of course our warehousing, we have made use where necessary uh, of local government schemes where we could have um, a reduction in working time um, or temporary, um, uh, temporary furloughing. Um, we have applied that in a number of countries, including uh, in Germany, especially where the frontline operations were affected. So if we have a sharp reduction in, um, in, 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 in part sales uh, towards Spain or Italy, for example, uh, the people who normally pick the parts and provide logistics, uh, a large part went into temporary uh, uh, unemployment. And we've done that across Europe. We haven't made any redundancy. So I think everything is picking up now. Uh, I think. There's a couple of markets where we still have uh, uh, people not 100% uh, uh, working yet, but that will be maybe until the end of this month. Then back to you. So, uh, Wojciech, do you want to add anything to this? <clears throat> no. <clears throat> no, not specifically maybe to, 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 let me say, the production planning or, or let me say, kind of the supply chain, but... Um, uh, maybe, maybe what I would like to, to 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 put your attention is that, you know, clearly, the pressure on cash flow uh, has increased dramatically. Okay, so we are now trying to do our best to be able to to fund and to find a very efficient way to continue our business operations. Okay, and uh, and uh, communication-wise, for example, okay, we are. Uh, facing quite a challenging period where we need to reduce, for example, our investments in something we call fixed marketing or communications. So uh, everything that is related to data, insights, individual dialogue with the customers needs to be dramatically uh, speed up. Okay, but because, you know, as you said, and as you mentioned, Dan, uh, uh, the, the over 50% of the industry drop must have effects on, on cash and, and profit. So everything we are touching today is very much efficient and flexible. Let's go to some uh, detailed topics I will share with uh, Gerhard. And when you already mentioned, uh, Wojciech, the, before the COVID, the electromobility was a very vigorous trend, a kind of mega trend. We are very proud that Autobest been one of the very first in the world and in Europe, first of all, who put this mega trend on the on the table? From your perspective, uh, how this trend will go on, generally speaking, and how Mazda will embrace this? Because before was something like Mazda preferred to be on its own on a different path, and now with the new uh, the first EV, looks like you join the trend. So. How, how is this from inside Mazda? Great question. Great question. So let me elaborate <clears throat> on that. So, uh, first of all, uh, I know that maybe there is kind of the impression that Mazda was not uh, onboarding this electrification trend, but I would like to really uh, somehow uh, uh, um, slightly disagree with that, okay? Because what we always said is that we believe and we have always believed in multi-solution approach. And in the multi-solution approach, it means that, uh, that electrification or kind of electrification will always play an important role. But as you know, we always believe that even in the future, even in probably in 2050, 
in the electrified vehicles, there will be components of internal combustion engine. So we said that why shouldn't we put the focus on making internal combustion engine extremely efficient? Because if we put then electrification into something that is efficient, it can multiply inefficiencies. If we put just plug-in hybrid, okay, hybrid is we hybridize the, 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 the vehicle and we put, let me say, the electric, electrified component into something that's not efficient, we don't believe it's the it's right, right thing. So my question uh, to, that we were asking ourselves many times with Martin and the team was, what would happen if we launched, for example, one year ago or two years ago, or like the fully electric, the, the, the battery electric vehicle? What, would it be smart decision? And uh, we believe not, because we are just putting uh, on the market, we are launching to the market our M uh, MX30, so the fully battery electric vehicle, just in the timing, at the timing where there, is, there are incentives, where the countries are talking about necessity to build charging infrastructure. So we believe we are putting this in the right moment uh, to the market. Uh, so in our perception, we are not late. Second thing, are we be, do we believe in this, if, if this trend of electrification? Yes, we believe in that, but we don't believe that it will be one and only solution about electrification. We believe it will be different solutions. And uh, let me finish maybe this part of my answer with a little bit of provocation. You rightly said then that Mazda was always trying to find our own path, our own way. We can assure you that also for electrification, Mazda will, will never give up finding our own way to put some technologies that are very unique that nobody is, will be able to just put and copy us, copy us easily. So even with the electrification trend, we believe we can be very much unique. Okay, there are many incoming questions about uh, this. By the way, uh, uh, you mentioned about a different uh, approach of electrification. Because this is the right moment, can you be a little bit more specific? What should be so particular for Mazda in approaching electrification? Just a few, few ideas. Uh, Martin? Shall I take this one? Yeah, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the, I'm the product geek, I guess, uh, from the two of us. Um, the, the thing is that um, the, 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 object, the Mazda's dream in building vehicles have always go towards an objective. What is my ultimate dream? What do I want to achieve? And the most important thing for us is to have the experience, the driving experience, the Jim Baitai, as we call it, stands at the center stage of every development that we do. And I think that drives very much looking for alternative solutions um, that, um, you know, you can, they don't necessarily, they're not different because for the sake of being different, they're different because they give us the answer that we want to have. So for example, um, if we talk about battery sizing, the efficiency of battery sizing, apart from the cost of a battery, you also have the weight of a battery and perfect weight distribution in the vehicle and the center of gravity. And this is the heart of Master's DNA in engineering is that you want the vehicle to keep the vehicle as light as possible, as agile as possible, as dynamic as possible. So what happens when you restack your car with a 70 kilowatts or six, 700 kilos worth of battery? And are there better solutions to that? Can we combine uh, uh, an efficient electric motor with a very efficient uh, combustion engine. So what hybridization can we do that is different maybe? And Wojciech mentioned it, if you couple a super efficient combustion engine to a, um, a, an electrical power plant, you have by definition a more efficient combination. Um, we also think that for, uh, we've talked about uh, uh, the battery electric vehicle, ideal sizing uh, the battery is important. But what for the situations where people want to drive a bit more or where there's range anxiety? Can we use, for example, the rotary engine? And can we use the rotary engine that is Mazda unique to charge uh, the battery whilst driving in case you are going to do a longer, a, a longer trip? Um, and I think it's the, this sort of thinking, so highly compact, efficient combustion engines in combination with right-size electrification from a 
from a footprint that is not just uh, uh, weight of the vehicle efficiency and cost, but also, okay, how does it work out on the environment? So if I lift a little curtain on that, and we've spoken about it a couple of times, for example, the return of the rotary engine as a power generator is for me super exciting. Gerhard? And uh, maybe, maybe... Yeah, please go check. Yeah, please allow me to supplement a little bit Martin's comment. So just imagine that we have all those options. What, what we see today is that there is needed important education for the customers, okay? Because, uh, yeah, there are some people that are really, really aware what the electrification means, but there's a lot of customers, there are a lot of customers in Europe that really uh, have not been yet by us educated enough, okay, to understand what electrification means, what are the solutions, what is the best tailor-made electrified vehicle for me. And uh, what we are doing, for example, as, uh, as Mazda, we have um, uh, launched the markets, the digital platform, where the customers can apply and are part of this discussion, are part of this presentation. And we have tried to test, let me see, this kind of the direct customer dialogue, very specific one about our uh, new electric vehicle. And uh, surprisingly um, to us, we had uh, more than 4,000 people that joined us. Uh, for those sessions and I think it's super exciting, super important because we saw that just the education of the customers, that just to talk with the customers, if you really want to become the customer centric brand is necessary needed because people just don't know in many countries how the use case, how the daily practice with the electric vehicle looks like, what should I do, what is, uh, uh, what is the advantage of having this kind of vehicle what are, what are the pain points uh, of, of such kind of the use case? So we are very, very, very keen uh, to also become quite of the unique in how we approach the customers to be able to make the people do right choices and not, let me say, then to regret that somebody chose to buy uh, our own new MX-30. Just a supplementary comment. Thank you. Thank you, Wojciech. Uh, by the way, um, you both of you mentioned the new Sky Active uh, Award. And the question is, how how is doing uh, the how are the sales for this uh, engine in the Mazda uh, Mazda European sales? Ah, that's a, a sales question. Um, SkyActiveX is doing extremely well, um, um, and um, it's available, of course, on the Mazda three and on the CX thirty, and it's about fifty percent of the sales mix. Um, so half of these vehicles are sold with a SkyActiveX power configuration. I have to say that, uh, of course, what we see and the SkyActiveX has a slightly higher price than the, the, the regular uh, SkyActiveG engine. Um, and you see that uh, many markets where there is a higher awareness of CO2, um, whether it is for taxation or whether it's for company car benefiting kind, you see that there the take rate almost goes up um, uh, and the mix is almost 100% in certain markets, whereas in other markets uh, it is lower. So it's very much driven also the, uh, the acceptance by local market conditions. But I'm very happy with it. Um, I had actually not forecasted that it would be uh, as high as 50%, if I'm, uh, if I'm honest with you. Um, and I look forward also in future to, uh, to grow um, on other car lines the, uh, this engine configuration or the technologies. You know, uh, Martin, 50%, it's huge. It's really impressive. Very impressive. Yeah. I, I, I would, myself, which I'm a quite a big fan of this engine, I, I was never imagining that so quickly, half of the sales can go so, so high for this engine. Uh, talking about engines, what, what is the situation uh, uh, of your rotary engine? Uh, it, it's going to be big again. Uh, you will use it in, in the combinations, as you mentioned. Uh, what, what is the, the today uh, approach of company for the, for the rotary engine? Maybe, maybe. But... Okay, Martin, sorry. Is yeah, yeah, you start, Wojciech, you start. Yeah, so um, what I would like to, to tell you is that we have never we have never given up the development of rotary, rotary engine. So it was somehow frozen in the development, but we have dedicated number of engineers 
that have been working in the last years in a hidden room in Hiroshima uh, uh, to, let me say, check the potential of the, of the repair engine. And you know, it has several advantages. Uh, first of all, it's hugely efficient engine. Second, that it can be fueled by different kinds of, of, of the fuel. And uh, you know why I'm, why I'm putting this angle a little bit, because, uh, because sometimes we talk about eco engines, about future, let me say, powertrains, only looking what kind of engine we have, but we forget a little bit about fuels. And uh, you know, just imagine that we have highly efficient engine, like rotary engine, maybe combined with some kind of electrification, and just imagine that we fuel this engine with, with CO2 neutral or synthetic or biofuel. And suddenly we are opening, let me say, completely new era, you know, completely new arena of the discussion because combustion engine can become zero emission engine if you fuel it properly. And this is one of the reasons why also, let me say, the rotary engine development has never been stopped because you know, one of the things that we have is also we are collaborating with some of the universities in Japan on the development of biofuel that doesn't compromise the food. It's based on the ocean algae, And we believe that this is some kind of the vision that also can make Mazda unique in the, in the future. Is it going to be, to, it, it, does it have already the scale, industrial scale? No, but is this thinking somehow inspiring our future thinking? Yes, it is. Uh, so with that, I would hand over to Martin to talk a little bit about mid-term, let me say, uh, perspective for for rotary engines. Martin, please. Yeah, I had to promise my boss that I wasn't going to divulge our uh, product cycle plan, which we of course keep uh, keep confidential. Um, for uh, for us, we have, uh, as Wojciech mentioned, we have this multi-solution strategy. So we have a very efficient combustion engine that we try to make more and more efficient. We have mild hybrid solutions on, um, on um, our smaller cars. We will soon have PHEV um, uh, solutions. So I think that for us, there will have a, a, a range of options that we can deploy in different parts of the, the world because, of course, demand across the world is very different. Um, uh, certain trends are different. And the rotary engine, essentially, at this moment, the part that I can mention to you is that the, the, the electricity generator uh, on board uh, of a uh, of a normal passenger car, not actually driving the vehicle but charging the battery, is the solution that we will come to market with uh, soonest. Any other things? Unfortunately, I cannot talk about. Uh, Martin, before we go to, uh, to Gerhard back, uh, it's important to, to to be short. What is the Mazda position in Europe for the diesel technology? Are you still investing in diesel technology, or everything stopped? Good question. Yes, we are investing in diesel technology, uh, next generation uh, uh, diesel. We also realize that diesel doesn't make sense on in all segments and on all car lines. So we're going to be uh, we're going to be more targeted in where we deploy our diesel engine. Be very specific, and um, I look forward to the, the the next generation diesel engine, which indeed we are investing in. Wojciech, you want to add anything or? No, no, just only to confirm, we, you know, we, we think, you know, um, from the strategy point of view, we believe that uh, also the use cases, the usage of the cars will be very much segmented in the future. Okay, so, uh, you know, sometimes on the certain forums, you know, I have a group of friends where we interact every day and, you know, everybody's passionate about the cars, but sometimes, you know, the questions that are, that are asked are somehow trying to uh, to, to, to put, let me say, the technology development or let me say how the industry in the future will look like into one bucket. We firmly believe it will be very much diversified, okay? So the usage of the car in, uh, in Norway, uh, let me say outside the city, will have nothing to do with the city car in the future, okay? So we believe that exactly like Martin mentioned, to understand the really what for the cars will be used in which environment for what kind of uh, of daily practices will also determine if one technology is better than others so again please let me come back and to reinforce that we believe in the multi-solution i believe that if somebody just 
make the choices. I will become, let me say, the company that will have 100% battery electric vehicles. It's a choice, but it means that this company will operate in the certain selected segments. We believe that with our multi-solution uh, technologies, like Martin mentioned, small, big, plugins, uh, uh, rotary engine somewhere in the equation, we can, within our dimension, satisfy different use cases for different use of, the, uh, of, of our customers. And for European markets, it's perfect strategy because you know that usage of the cars in Italy today uh, have nothing to do with, for example, usage of the car in, in Scandinavia. And we see it more and more. So yes, diesel, does diesel have future? Yes, for certain countries, for certain, certain uh, customers. And that's why we continue to develop the diesel. Is it going to be the same mix, uh, the same quantity and the same, let me say, kind of the logic that we'll have diesel everywhere in every segment? Definitely not. But we will not give up development of this technology because we believe it can be clean, it will be clean, and it will satisfy some of the customers. Good. Gerhard, please. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry for this. I had, I had a shutdown. <laughs> <laughs> My internet broke down completely. So what was the last thing that you heard from me? Um, doesn't matter. Go to the last. Okay. Anyway, I, I wanted to check on, on, on future products. And uh, uh, I hear about uh, uh, a bigger SUV above the CX-5, maybe in the segment of the former CX-7 or even bigger, coming also to Europe in the midterm. And this should also be coming with a plug-in hybrid, which I hear will be available at Mazda in the portfolio in 2021. Can you comment a little bit on this? And uh, what is your perspective on plug-in hybrids? I think, Martin, you can be the... The product man. The speaker. <laughs> um, I, I think you are very well informed. <laughs> Well, we are indeed working, of course, on our next generation vehicle. Um, and we, uh, we have, uh, as we talked about, a smaller platform. We also have a larger platform. Um, our large platform is in development. And, uh, of course, technological base includes uh, plug-in uh, plug hybrid um, as, of course, a basic request for, uh, for the market. And uh, exciting uh, engine configurations and a very, very exciting uh, uh, set of body style derivatives. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm working currently on the, on the sales planning um, of, uh, of, uh, of what is to come. And uh, yeah, I can, uh, I can confirm that your assumptions in that sense are, uh, are right. So um, we're planning on it. We started planning on that. Um, and, and, and usually in Europe, we start around... Um, what is it, Wojciech, 12, 18 months before launch, we really get into, into gear. And uh, for us, uh, the, uh, yeah, the SUV segment uh, remains very strong, uh, a lot of potential for us, a very high customer satisfaction for us. And uh, I look forward to a next generation SUV hitting the market uh, uh, um, in the next uh, 24 months. So please allow us all to, to, to be very sensitive when we talk about future Timing and cycle plans is obvious, but what but what what we can what we can say is that we are going to take every opportunity, including the launch of the new platform or new technologies, um, also to reinforce uh, our relationship with the customers. Okay, so the launch of the product in the current era is uh, reinforcing our link, our relationship, our dialogue, our bond with the customers. So we believe that also communication-wise, engagement-wise. Uh, we'll, we'll be doing quite innovative things. Good. We are in a bit delay based on our schedule. Therefore, uh, Gerhard, I propose you to go to the Q&A session. And there are already hands uh, raised to have uh, uh, questions. Um, I will ask uh, my colleagues uh, to put just one question and uh, I will ask Martin and uh, Wojciech to be as short as possible because we we really want to answer to so many questions. I will start with uh, my dear colleague Håkan from Sweden. Håkan? Yes, hi. Um, I think this is a question for you, Martin. Uh, I go back to the time back in Frankfurt, uh, 2017, everybody was speaking about electrification, except for, for uh, Masta. Masta 
choose to go their own path, which I now understand why you did. But the problem with this is that, I mean, if we're looking at the Swedish market, you, you know the Swedish market, how that works. And Mazda used to be a, a, a fairly good volume car on the Swedish market. We have, so far this year, 487 uh, new registrations on Mazda in Sweden. 487 registrations. And this is due to the fact that there was no electrification strategy from the beginning. And the fact that there was no electrification strategy from the beginning, you also uh, put yourself in danger for, for the fines from the European Union because you couldn't comply with the CAFE 95. Uh, this added to the prices of the vehicles in Sweden. And it also, uh, uh, at the same time, we came with, with a new taxation from the, from the beginning of the year, which actually increased the cost of the vehicle to a point where it's no more, not as interested as before. So my question here is that, why uh, haven't Mazda thought about complying with the, the, the regulations for the European market in an earlier uh, Wojciech is it's, uh, waving here. He wants to answer that question. So let's, okay, Wojciech, answer it. Why didn't you comply from the beginning with what's going to happen on the European market? Because you are suffering now with the volume. And uh, it's not only the, the you are suffering, the, the master dealers are suffering. And, uh, so I, I will let, let me prepare like a little bit the ground of the answer for Martin related to the specific dealer and the volume, uh, uh, let me say, a uh, question related to, to Sweden. But uh, um, as in your question were certain hypotheses, I would like also a little bit to make the reference to them. Okay, so first of all, you know, we, uh, we really don't believe that we are late in the electrification because, as you know, we have not paid any fines because we have the open pooling with our partners, with Toyota, and we have done the pooling agreement for 2018, 2019. And this is, uh, this is something that was already planned as our, uh, in, our, in our business case and in our business plan. Okay? We are working with Toyota on different aspects like basic electrification, connectivity. We are building Alabama plant together. And also the fourth leg of our collaboration is this pooling agreement that we did in 2018-2019. So Mazda hasn't paid fine because the pool is under threshold okay. for 2018-2019. Yeah, so, so this is the first thing. That's why <clears throat> we have exactly planned when and how we want to attack and to, 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 to be on the market. And we are respecting our, our path on some local markets. It can be visible that, yeah, we are suffering. Okay, Sweden can be one, but also Norway can be, can be the second. But in overall picture, uh, we knew that there will be some challenges. Uh, you know, the, the, the discussion about cycle plan at Mazda are the discussions that are global. We have to, we are not producing specific cars for certain, certain regions. We are trying to make the bundled planning uh, that somehow compromises and requires the, uh, the, 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 the alignment between different regions, uh, so uh, so uh, we are respecting our, our 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 plan, and we don't pay fines. We uh, we don't pay fines, and we don't pay fines in Europe. So this is this is something I would like to underline. And with that, maybe I will hand over to Martin. Uh, just one question, then. I know that I couldn't take too much time because my colleagues want to ask questions as well. As well, but then my question comes: Then why did the Mazda raise the prices between five and ten percent on the vehicles this year on the Swedish market? Uh, which is, according to everybody is talking about this, is saying it's in order to cover the, the, the fines the Mazda will be paying because they cannot uh, comply with the CAFE 95. It's, it's coming back to, to, to the rumors that spread around the, the brand. Yeah, well, I know, Hogan, that you're sitting in a Mazda dealer at the moment, so I realize that yeah, <laughs> the dealer has, uh, has, has, not, has, not, uh, has not had a very successful 2020. They've had a very, very good 2019. Um, and I realize that, indeed, we did register a lot of cars with higher CO2 in, uh, in 2019. 
Um, what we have, um, I think there's a couple of things that are coming together. Wojciech said it about uh, having a, um, a global cycle plan in the sense that we produce cars for the globe and uh, the markets where there have been extreme movements in electrification already in the last two or three years based on, uh, on incentives. Of course, we have not been able to benefit from that. Our planning for Cafe 95, I think all our cars, if we look at WLTP homologation, uh, compliance, Mazda has not had any any issue. Um, and we it was all part of our, our plan. And I think we have not been disrupted in our in our in our supply chain due to homologation requirements and changes to uh, to legislations like WLTP. Um, our our planning always, if you remember that we went to 130 grams many, many years ago, uh, where Mazda was uh, uh, be, uh, uh, above that. Um, and by introducing new technologies, because Mazda has, as Wojciech said, bundled planning. When we introduce new technology, we roll it out across all our car lines and we can do that in 12 to 24 months. So when we introduced the first Skyactiv, our CO2 came down by 20-25% uh, within about 18 months. So I think that it's very difficult, of course, and I realize where you're standing from, you look at, you know, you judge the future based on, on the past uh, uh, performance, but our, um, our uh, product cycle plan addresses the challenges. When you talk about our price increases, indeed we've had price increases um, um, in, uh, in Sweden, but also in, uh, in Norway. Um, but I also hope you have seen the exchange rate of the Norwegian uh, krona and the Swedish krona, where um, of course we um, we import from uh, from uh, Japan. We balance our business case, uh, and apart from of course pricing for technologies like hi mild hybrids that we introduced on the on the cars, we indeed also had to compensate in our uh, in our uh, business case for what happened to the exchange rate. So I'm not denying that we uh, our price increase has been high. Uh, we need to cover, as a smaller manufacturer, huge investments, uh, electrification being one of them, but also our total ambitions. Uh, but unfortunately, the, the market situation in uh, Sweden and Norway especially has particularly suffered uh, also because of our compensation for exchange rate. I hope that, uh, and our plan is definitely for, um, for a rebound. Uh, we hope that the, the product mix that we'll be launching um, uh, will rebound. We've had ups and downs across all of Europe uh, uh, many times in the last uh, 15 years. And I recall my time in, uh, in Sweden when I was, uh, as I said earlier, I was, uh, um, I was younger and I had more hair on my head, um, that we had uh, a significant dip in, in sales also exchange rate driven product cycle plan specifics. I remember you had E85 in Sweden. If you didn't have E85, one couldn't sell any car and your market share suffered. So we will go up and down and I'm, I'm looking forward to the future where I'm sure it will, um, it will improve. And, um, um, and I think, I hope also exchange rate improves because of course the balancing of the exchange rate is very important for our total business balance um, from a profit point of view. Well, it's actually improving right now. Okay, I don't... Uh, I'm thank, you. thank you, Hawk, and we, we, we have so many questions and the time is running out. Yeah, Please, I know. Uh, accept that. Thank you. Tough questions, by the way. Thank you very much. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we go now in Hungary to our dear colleague, uh, uh, Gabor Sheshini, which is representing uh, his country in Auto West. Gabor, I know you have several questions. Please, yeah. just one. I like to be efficient and quick as, as much as, as possible. Uh, back to efficiency, we've been talking a lot about efficiency now. Uh, what's the, the, the role in the whole picture of the, the conventional, the more conventional technologies like turbo petrol, which is a good proven thing for, for years now? Will, will Mazda bring turbo petrols to, to Europe too? I think you are uh, referring, of course, to our recent uh, launch or announced launch of uh, of the turbo version of the yeah. the two and a half liter in the, in, the, okay. in the United States. It's a very exciting engine. Um, um, it, it is an engine that they have also on the CX-9. It's available on the CX-5 and on the Master 6, and now, of course, in the in the Master 3, uh, the the hearts of the Americans that want to go uh, fast in a straight line, <laughs> as we always joke. Um, I think it's a fantastic engine. Um, and, uh, we, we talk now about balancing earlier on our business case. It is not a smart engine when we look at it from, uh, from, 
from what the European market at this stage wants. We focused on Skyactiv X, um, and we weren't we're not planning introduction of uh, of that specific uh, turbo engine for uh, for Europe. We do, however, have other uh, uh, plans where we used, uh, you know, either the supercharged uh, technology like on the Skyactiv X. Um, but um, um, at this moment, a two and a half liter turbo is not foreseen for Europe. Good. Now let's move to Poland, to our uh, auto best dear friend, Sepan. Sepan, one question, please. Hello, everybody. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, your forecast, I mean Mazda forecast for the market share of electric, ve electric vehicles in 2025 and 2030 maybe in Europe. And I would like to ask how European Commission will influence into the sales of electric cars. Can I give this one to Wojciech who is closer to, uh, to the Brussels office? Yeah, yeah. Thank you, thank you, Stefan. Good question. So, um, the real answer about what would be the percentage of the cars is a holy great question. Okay, we don't know, right? We really don't know. We have some assumptions. Uh, what what we know is that probably in 2030, almost 100 percent of the cars on the market will be electrified. Yeah. So this is something that uh, that, that we think. So talking with Brussels uh, and we're talking with the Commission. You know, we see that the Green Deal generally is seen here in Europe as a, as a trend that has to accelerate the economy. So it's not seen as a kind of the investment. It's not seen as a stopper of whatever. It's seen as a good, uh, let me say, accelerator uh, that can improve uh, European economy, European innovation. And uh, frankly, frankly speaking, we agree with this kind of, of, of point of view. We, we believe that, uh, uh, that, that, that mid-term, mid I mean 2030, 2040, electrification is the right technology if we take in consideration life cycle assessment, okay? So LCA or well to wheel, okay? So we, we, we believe that, the, that um, uh, the, 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 the greenhouse emissions and the carbon footprint to be definitely taking into consideration in, in our strategy. Uh, European Union is putting quite a big of emphasis, okay, and many countries, many member states countries now are putting incentives, you are very much aware about incentives uh, that are mainly focused on kind of electrified or electric uh, vehicles. Uh, and this makes sense. What for us doesn't make sense is that, for example, if there is not enough demand, so we don't have enough customers in the short term to sell those cars, those cars, that would bring us into penalty area, potentially. So what has been paid to make the incentives could be repaid back with the fines of the manufacturers. So this is something we would like, we would be keen to discuss uh, with European Commission if this is really kind of the full intention of, about, about, about what they, they want. But saying that, we believe and we definitely support, let me say, this eco trend. We have to save the earth. We have to do, let me say, to, to do everything to put a, a new modern technology, innovative te technology. And today, uh, there is no alternative, credible alternative, if not kind of the electrification. But I would like to underline one more, one more time, electrification doesn't mean 100% BEV vehicles. Electrification means component of electrification in the different configurations in the future cars. Okay, guys, we still have uh, free questions. So uh, we will stop to this free, please be quick and please be also from our dear guests, uh, key speakers to be very short. Ilya, uh, our dear Autobest jury president from Bulgaria. Ilya? In uh, these very heavy business times, uh, even you guys uh, are looking for support from other. You uh, know about the last uh, Union uh, American U Europe Atlantis. So Mazda is still resist to stay alone. Do you have any plans for uh, wedding with some company to resist all these uh, problems? Yeah, thank you for your question. I will be very quick. So we believe that. Uh, uh, it's necessary to build different alliances 
but it doesn't mean that we have to exchange the capitals. We have already exchanged the capitals with Toyota. You know that uh, we have exchanged, let me say, 500 million. We bought stocks from Toyota and they bought 500 million stocks from Mazda. And this is something that is working. It's, uh, we, uh, it allows, allowed us to open uh, collaboration spaces for many activities. So let me give you an example. We, we have been working and we've finished development with Toyota of the basic kind of the future electrification platforms. We are building together a new factory in Alabama, United States, in US, Alabama. And we continue development of the common uh, connectivity platform. So do we need alliances? Yes. Does it mean that we have to be bought by somebody or merged with somebody uh, capital wise? Does it necessarily mean it? Good. Uh, <coughs> Krumislav uh, from Macedonia. Krumislav, uh, please. Yes, you mentioned several times your collaboration with uh, Toyota from one side. <coughs> you mentioned that you're a bit, little bit uh, late with the electrification of your uh, models. Uh, does it mean that uh, you will skip some steps and uh, go further with, uh, with uh, hydrogen propulsion in your cars? Yeah. It's, uh, so, uh, as we are concerned uh, of time, the hydrogen technology is not part of the, uh, of the, of the, current, of the current, let me say, credible uh, let me say, cycle plan we have. So uh, my answer cannot confirm this hypothesis. Good, very quick, thank you, Wojciech. Now the last one, <coughs> Okan from uh, Turkey uh, is having one question. Okan? Hello, uh, hello, Martin. Uh, uh, my question is actually a bit difficult, uh, as you mentioned, uh, with the European uh, numbers, but uh, Turkey is uh, maybe in the worst position. Last year they sold here uh, only 400 cars, and uh, this year, in six months, only 61 cars. Uh, this is incredible low numbers. Uh, if we are comparing with Toyota, Suzuki, Mitsubishi, for example, Toyota has sold this year in six months around 12,000. Mitsubishi, the smallest company in Turkey, this, uh, Mitsubishi Turkey is very small. They sold around uh, very close to 2,000 and Honda uh, more than 8,000. Can you imagine uh, so beautiful Mazda cars, so good technologies, and your team is working here uh, a bit slow? Hi. I'm not sure. Thank you for the question. I think it's a fair question. Um, I'm, I'm also very disappointed that we are not uh, more successful in Turkey. Uh, there have been many reasons for that. I think for us, of course, as an importer versus being able to manufacture locally, like some of the other um, Japanese brands, uh, where we've had to deal with extreme changes in uh, in, in the exchange rate, uh, very difficult to plan. Uh, we also cannot sell the same vehicles in uh, in Turkey as we uh, can in um, in, in uh, other Western European countries at this moment for us, due to some regulatory uh, challenges that we have with regard to e-call. Um, and um, I think that for us, the, uh, the 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 engine technologies that we have, based on the taxation system as such make it extremely challenging. So indeed, uh, we are not happy, and none of us are happy with it. We do our best to satisfy the customers that we have with, uh, with their vehicles. And I think what we are um, hoping for is that our vehicles in the taxation system with the right pricing exchange rate uh, 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 balance, we can, uh, we can recover. But it's one of my, um, it's one of my uh, unhappy points. Yeah. Good. Uh, as we, we are now ending the questions, I will uh, ask uh, both of you, Wojciech and Martin, to have a two-minute uh, intervention about how do you see, from the Mazda Euro perspective, this second part of 2020. Wojciech? Thank you very much. So, first of all, thank you again for hosting us and, uh, and giving us opportunity to really present our our honest point of view about industry, and uh, it's always good to have, let me say, good inspiration from the experts. So thank you uh, for this initiative, really well done. So, uh, uh, of course, everything depends uh, if this, what, what, what will be the development uh, and customer confidence related to, to, to the second or third wave of the, of the COVID-19. Um, we believe that what we see now, uh, also looking at 
something that happened in China, we think that the recovery uh, can be quite rapid. If the customer confidence grows, uh, people come back to, 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 to the good habits and are trying to buy the cars. We have seen, for example, in the United States, we have seen in China, uh, we have seen other markets that are performing even in better, they're selling more year over year, uh, if, if we take the amount of the performance versus what, uh, uh, versus 20, 2019. Uh, so really we believe that if the situation, the pandemic situation will be somehow under control and so there will be good news related to potential vaccination uh, and the social distancing will be somehow kept, that there will not be huge outbreaks we believe that uh, the situation can uh, somehow come to the to the normality, but the heat in terms of of cash flow, of the profitability of the stocks that we that we had this year, it definitely compromises a lot of investment. So we will be working with high pressure, with the huge attention on cash flow, with a huge attention on expenses, uh, and you know in my area all the expenses related to the communication to the media buy probably will accelerate something we call marketing transformation and we will accelerate our journey towards data insight and development of MarTech, so marketing technologies. So uh, what I see, it will be a year and the second half of the huge transformation in automotive industry uh, towards new reality, new, new future that will have a lot of more digital, uh, digital, digital uh, uh, informations. And uh, product wise, we believe that electrification uh, will, 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 will take off. We have seen quite strong incentives in many countries, including Germany, and we can see also first good performance, including our NX30 uh, uh, customer order. So interesting uh, 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 second half, uh, and a lot of learnings will come from, from let me say, uh, July, August until December. Thank you very much for hosting us. Martin. Okay, Wojciech, Martin, your two minutes. My two minutes, okay. I'm timing. Well, I look forward, as Wojciech ended on the MX-30, the electric vehicle, um, I'm happy that we, uh, in my daily statistics, I can see that we've already, uh, before launch, sold 30% of what we thought we were going to sell, so I'm, I'm very enthusiastic uh, about that. Um, I know that coming out of a, uh, a lockdown situation, coming out of a situation where many people have been furloughed also with our network, my role is to support the network to make sure that credit lines are okay. We keep on working with our with our banking partners to uh, to ensure that we have a, a healthy continuous business flow. Because growth uh, growth might be just as challenging from a cash perspective as uh, as shrinkage. Um, and I see uh, an extreme diversification in Europe. I have colleagues in markets that actually there's one. On market in Europe that is writing record orders this month, so the highest ever in the history of, uh, of Mazda operations. Uh, and we've got markets that are extremely slow coming out of uh, the pandemic. And as Wojciech said, keeping, the, keeping um, our business going, the economy going with the right levels of social distancing uh, so that dealers can operate and customers can feel safe uh, is my priority. Um, 2020 will be a year that uh, that I hopefully will forget very soon. And uh, if 2021 can uh, can can start with a with a clean sheet, it's going to be an exciting future for for Master, especially with the new products that we've uh, got lined up. So thank you very much, also from my side. Thank you, Martin Gerhard. If you want to add uh, one sentence at the end of the the summit. Thank you very much. One quick. Final question. This year, 100 years of Mazda. If you remember 91, which is 30 years gone next year, and with Mazda being a winner in the American IMSA series with the Daytona prototype, and the Daytona prototypes of IMSA being uh, associated now with WEC and Le Mans with a common formula of engines, what about the Mazda comeback in Le Mans? Um, let, let, let me tell like that, uh, you know, we have a lot of dreams in our company and you know, I think that the companies and the people that don't have dreams will not do even the first step uh, towards those dreams. Uh, we have dreams to come back to Le Mans, we have dreams to come to Le Mans with something very strong, but uh, uh, at the same time, 
believe us, uh, we need to fix the basics. We need to guarantee that our families, our employees, our dealers uh, uh, have the guaranteed good future. And unfortunately, this doesn't come from starting, let me say, the, from, from starting our comeback to Le Mans. I think that Le Mans and such kind of, of, of dreams can happen as a confirmation of the good basic strategy. And what we were discussing today, um, Gerard, was exactly how to fix the basic strategy, how to guarantee that Europe is strong, that Mazda is strong, that you are successful in the launches, and then discussions about Le Mans, etc. believe me, will come back. And uh, you can see a little bit of passion in Martin's and mine eyes. Uh, and fortunately, you know, we have, uh, let me say, two guys and we have also more team members that are simply passionate uh, people uh, and will do our best also to have some fun and not only to address the pain. So I hope that this gives you a little bit the feeling uh, or, uh, how we feel at Mazda uh, also about those ple ple pleasant part of automotive business. Thank you very much. So, uh, dear friends uh, from all around Europe, uh, who all of you look to, to the, the live transmission, uh, dear colleagues, I guess I'm speaking on behalf of all of you to thank to our uh, uh, key speakers from Mazda Europe, Martin uh, Ten Brink, the Vice President of Sales and Customer Experience Service, and uh, Wojciech uh, Halarevich, the Vice President of Communications and Public Affairs, it was really, really uh, interesting, and uh, we learned all of us, I guess, so many, so many things. Uh, I, I, I never put uh, conclusions because I believe uh, we are far away from being able to ask everything. We need uh, probably days to talk about everything, so we don't claim that uh, this kind of summit in the online format can uh, do everything and can find out everything. However. We learned so many things, very interesting things. And I uh, strongly believe that this summit will have a huge contribution in Europe to make people understanding much better the philosophy of Mazda, the strategies of Mazda and the products Mazda is deploying in a different way. But that's, that's not only my opinion, I guess. Everybody here is thinking the same way. That's the trick. You don't have to copy. I mean, we are against, it. Autobest is a good example. We never copied. We always pioneered. We always innovated. And I'm so happy that uh, we discovered that Mazda is following this path of innovation, of pioneering new things, testing new things, in spite of not being a very big company with very deep pockets. So on behalf of Autobest, I want to congratulate uh, you both and Mazda for taking this path. And of course, uh, uh, we all hope that you will be successful uh, with your strategy. Thank you very much to everybody again. So that, that was it. Uh, we will come back uh, to the, our summits in uh, autumn with uh, other uh, colleagues from the automotive industry. All the best to you all. All the best. Thank you. All the best. Thank, Thank you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you.